All right, hi, I'm meteorologist Tony Petrocker alongside meteorologist TJ Del Santo. TJ, another month of Beyond the Forecast, and we've been talking about this actually for the last several months, the upcoming hurricane season, and a lot of buzz like on social media about perhaps uh, how active it may be, and we're going to cover that today. We have um, some viewer questions that we're going to answer, but uh, getting a lot of interest, especially as we're getting close to the start of the season, officially June 1st. That's right, so it's only... It's very close. So that 182-day period from June 1st to November 30th. Um, so talking about um, uh, an active season, when we say that, not, not so much the strength of hurricanes, but also the, potentially the number of storms. Uh, now, NOAA will be putting out their outlook next week, um, but there have been some private sector uh, uh, people and, and companies that have been putting out their forecasts that you and I have been looking at. Uh, one of the more popular ones for years has actually been out of, out of Colorado State, started by Dr. Gray, uh, the late Dr. Gray and um, William, William Bill Gray, and then taken over by, and I have a hard time saying his last name, and he's he's from around here, Phil. I think you're right. Phil Claus. Klaus, Klaus back? Okay. Pardon us if we got it wrong. What's interesting is is he's um, he's been leading this uh, Colorado State University study for, for many, many years, the Outlook, uh, and told me one time that he grew up watching Channel 12, so he's from the area. That's fantastic. So why don't we just, before we get to some of the viewer questions, why don't we get started with some of the hard numbers as far as what a typical season looks like and what some of the, the private sector are looking at. And it's, it's, it's pretty startling. What do you think of these numbers here when you see them? Yeah, the number of name storms, uh, you know, on average is 14. But look at all of these uh, forecasts are expected to be well above that. You know, what's that, 23 expected by Colorado State University, AccuWeather, 2025. And uh, the weather company, uh, yep. which provides our weather data here at Channel 12, uh, they're expected to have 24 name storms. Now, that's a storm that reaches a strength of uh, 39 miles an hour, a tropical storm. So it's either tropical or hurricane. Correct. I think the one misconception about, oh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a busy hurricane season, you see these numbers, this is not a landfalling forecast. No. So in other words, these are the number of storms anticipated to form in the Caribbean, the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico. Where they go is a whole, you know, but the fact that there are more storms than average lends the, the to the idea that perhaps more landfall this year. Yeah, the more, the more chances you get, there's a better chance of it making landfall somewhere. I mean, we don't know where. I mean, it's impossible to yep. say in May that we're going to get a hurricane in September. That's impossible. But these, I mean, uh, you average all three of these um, private sectors, and they're, and they're generally in that 20 to 25 range for the number of storms. That's a lot. As far as hurricanes, we average that. I would say, like, the average is probably about 11 on, on, on these three companies. And then as far as major, it looks like the average here is, like, six or seven. So kind of a busy season. You know, as we know, uh, you and I have done this for a long time. Uh, Long-range seasonal forecasting is not easy, but we do um, uh, look at oceans. and, and, and There are things that you can look exactly. at. Exactly. I mean, we can't, like we are saying, we can't tell you where a hurricane is going to go, but we can kind of tell you whether or not it's going to be a busy season, and we're pretty good at that. Yeah, so the, the biggest driving factor besides the sun, of course, are the oceans, and especially sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Dan Brown at the, uh, at the National Hurricane Center not too long ago, and we were talking about uh, El Nino, La Nina, and sea surface temperatures, and here's what he had to say about the, the potential the season. The public is very familiar with the terminology El Nino, La Nina, where does that take us into the hurricane season as far as, you know, potential activity? Yeah, so we've uh, we've had these El Nino conditions. Uh, really, they were there last hurricane season, continue through this winter. Uh, but a lot of the climate models suggest that uh, we'll be transitioning back to La Nina conditions, uh, which tends to favor more activity in the Atlantic. Uh, we've also seen very high sea surface temperatures uh, across the Atlantic uh, uh, the last few months, and, and those are likely to continue. So, Indications are it, it, it could be another active hurricane season, but NOAA won't release its official hurricane season forecast until we get into about mid-May. All right, so as far as the official outlook, <laughs> excuse me, from NOAA, uh, that is coming out um, the third week of May. And, of course, we're going to have more on that. In fact, I'm working on a story that will be airing um, uh, next week. Uh, talking more about the NOAA outlook. But it, it's safe to say that it, it's anticipated to be an active season. And uh, you and I had drawn up some some graphics as far as, you know, things that we look at as far as sea surface temperatures. So uh, take a peek. Afraid we're, none of us are going to go swimming at Scarborough yet. It's chilly. <laughs> it's in the 50s. But yeah. as we go through the summer, it really starts to heat up. These are the sea surface temperatures right now 
You can see all that red down there in the tropics. Uh, you know, it's pretty warm already, and it's only going to get uh, warmer as, you know, we get into the heart of summer and into fall. And that's, hurricanes feed off of warm water. That's their fuel. Warmer the water, the better, and they'll, they'll strengthen as they work their way across the Atlantic. But we're talking about, you know, the differences to normal. I mean, look at the reds right across the tropics, and this is now. So we got sea surface temperature anomalies, and that area, I'm going to put my glasses on too, where it says above normal water temperatures, that strip of dark red where we see the very warm waters, that's called the MDR, the main development region, and that's where most uh, of our storms actually get their start. And the fact that the water is so warm is, an, is another uh, kind of a red flag. Teach, uh, swing us over to um, the other side of the world. Uh, and we hear a lot about El Nino and La Nina. Uh, we were in an in a El Nino, and now heading towards a La Nina. So in other words, we're now uh, favoring, or we're, we're now seeing a strip of cooler than Pacific waters in that equatorial area just to the, uh, to the west of South America. And you and I look at this, and it doesn't look like much. Okay, so it's cooling <laughs> off. What's the deal? But it, it does impact uh, the global circulations. Yeah, and especially in the... Um in the summer, in the Atlantic, La Nina can kind of <laughs> cut down on what we call wind shear. Um, the, uh, the waters can help feed hurricanes, <laughs> but the, the tops of hurricanes can get blown off uh, during an El Nino year, like kind of like what we had last year. But La Nina is just the opposite. There's not much wind shear or, or winds to kind of blow the tops off of hurricanes, so <laughs> they can strengthen a little bit more easily. So bear with me on this explanation. So right. as far as trying to explain to the folks at home, wind shear and why hur you know, hurricanes are wind storms, but they don't like the wind around them to be strong. As you have a stick of, of cotton candy, you're in the car, <laughs> and the car is traveling 60 miles an hour. Open the window, stick out. Now that cotton candy is a hurricane. Stick it out the window. It goes, whoop. It gets shredded apart. Yeah. And it's the same thing with a hurricane. If, when there are environments of strong wind shear, they'll get torn apart, and either they'll weaken rapidly or they have a hard time developing. But with lack of wind shear, they have a, a longer shelf life and a better, a better chance of intensification. And, and another big factor as to why the season may be ramped up. That's about the only sweet way that you can uh, you know, talk about hurricanes. They, uh, ho ho hopefully that, hopefully that, all, uh, that all made sense. Um, why don't we go to some questions? We, we've got a lot of good feedback this time around. We do. All right. Um, question number one. How are hurricanes given their names. And while, while we're reading this, I'm going to let you kind of queue up to that, um, to the graphic where we have a hurricane name. So question one and TJ will queue up a graphic uh, for us. How are hurricanes given their names? Why is it in alphabetical order? Uh, this is um, Jamie from Barrington. <coughs> I want to know why there's not an Anthony on the list or a TJ. Well, there's sort well, there'll <laughs> probably never be a TJ, but um, I right, take a look at we get the, these are the names now. Is it it's the World Meteorological Organization? That's right. Yeah. So they they come up with the names every year, uh, and it's alphabetical order as far as you know when they form. You know, it's a chronological order. You know, the first storm is A, right? The second storm is B, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it alternates. Uh, it just makes it easier when it's an alphabetical order as opposed to just kind of skipping around. Uh, I think that was part of the question. You know, why is it an alphabetical order? And it, and it started back in the early fifties. We you know naming <laughs> storms. It's just to kind of keep track of, of, of storms. Before, it used to be called latitude and longitude, yep. where a hurricane was. But the thing is, hurricanes move, so it's important to kind of give everybody an idea of what storm you're talking about. So we name them. So Alberto's the first one. We have <laughs> six different lists yep. that we go through. Uh, so this list basically was used, what, seven years ago? Yeah, it'll repeat. And it'll, it'll repeat, you know, and, and down the line. But a name and, will get retired. That's if right. If, if it is an exceptionally devastating hurricane, so uh, you'll never see a Hurricane Katrina again. You'll never see um, a Hurricane Carol again, things like that. Sandy. Uh, and never Sandy. Seen Irene, uh, you know, names that have, uh, Bob, another one that's uh, come up here. Uh, you know, a lot of these names that may be familiar, <laughs> Alberto, Beryl, Chris, Debbie. And look what's down that list, Tony. You don't want to get to Tony, because that would be an extremely, uh, an extremely busy season. Um, so... Uh, and, and we've gone through the entire list at, at, at one point. That, 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 that is a question that we have a little further down. Um, I don't want to let you queue, the, queue up this next graphic. Um, what is the worst hurricane on record in our area? And that's April, from April, uh, from Barrington. There's really, there's really two. The, the, the big one, and it's not just the worst in New England. It's probably one of the worst 
uh, really for the entire continental U.S., and that is the unnamed uh, surprise hurricane of 1938. I mean, just I mean the benchmark of all devastating hurricanes. This, this is a, a Category 3 hurricane that nobody knew was coming. Or the technology in 38 is nothing. Well, look where it came from. It came off the <laughs> coast of Africa. I mean, we had some indication that it was there. I mean, they did. Via ships. Yes. But <laughs> there was really no great way to transmit it, you know, to the United States and warn people that it was coming. Moved uh, just to the north of the Bahamas, an old phrase, a storm of the, storm of the name in the Bahamas. You better be ready for it up here in southern New England, and that's what happened back in 1938. Didn't have a name, of course, <laughs> but anytime you get a storm down there, you got to pay attention to it. But uh, yeah, Hurricane in 38, the Long Island Express was given a few different names. And then, and then the next one after that would be uh, Hurricane Carol. Hurricane Carol, similar kind of impacts here in southern yeah. New England with the flooding, downtown Providence, uh, you know, up to 15, even 20 foot storm surges in some areas. And take note, our worst hurricanes, the 38 and Carroll, actually the center actually tracks over Connecticut. And why that is so huge, it puts you on the right-hand side of the storm. Yeah. That is the where the winds are blowing onshore. So quite simply, in that kind of a track, you're pushing ocean water up Buzzards Bay, up Narragansett Bay. That is the storm surge, which is just ridiculous. Coming That's up. the most dangerous part of the storm. Oh, hands Catch, down. Catches people off guard all the time. Uh, and not that say that the, the wind is not dangerous, No, I obviously. mean, there's a bunch of different factors, but... <laughs> but yeah, the, the storm surge. All right, uh, question. We've got great questions. Um, what are the ideal conditions for, well, she says a Category 4 hurricane, or really any hurricane, Kathleen from Charlestown. And you just talked about this a few seconds ago, uh, warm sea surface temperatures. The, the, the baseline is like 79, 80 degrees. You need that warm water, and not just at the surface, but also deep below as well. There's so much what we call potential energy, latent heat, uh, that's stored in the oceans, and it's just the fuel to have these storms just really intensify. And we you can't have that well, we, that upper level wind shear either. You start no. getting that, mm. and the storm could could potentially fall apart. Sometimes those stronger storms can maintain their their strength <laughs> if there's a little bit of wind shear around, but. Um, typically, yeah, you want that really warm water and very little uh, wind shear in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And they have to stay over water as well. I mean, sometimes you'll get them over land and they'll, they'll weaken a little bit. But, you know, the Category 4, the Category 5 <coughs> storms, those are the storms that are out in the middle of the ocean for a long period of time. So if there's any takeaway, it's very warm water and, and the lack of uh, any strong wind shear. All right. Uh, and I'm going to let you queue up the, um, the uh, that frequency graph for us. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Why do hurricanes form in the summer and early fall? Andy from Barrington. I mean, the season runs June 1 all the way to November, the end of November. But typically, it uh, it ramps up uh, around here, August and September. So we take a look at the uh, the frequency here. Yeah, these are like home, what we call homegrown <laughs> hurricanes. They yep. typically form closer to the United States uh, in the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico. Sometimes they'll impact us. These tend to bring some flooding rain sometimes. The, the, these homegrown ones yep. don't really have a lot of time to develop into strong hurricanes. But as we move along into the summer, we begin <laughs> to see that uh, area where they form kind of expand. Uh, there's one right over the uh, Gulf Stream, and there's, of course, that one right down there in the middle of the Atlantic in the tropics. Uh, that's where the uh, the stronger ones will form. And that goes right into the uh, fall, into September. <laughs> Boy, look at that. Yeah. September is the busiest time of year for hurricanes here in uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And our, our, the our most historical hurricanes here have been in August and sep September. Hurricane Bob, Hurricane Gloria, the 38 hurricane, Carol. Uh, Hurricane Carol. Um, hurricane all those Donna. hurricanes, all those tropical <laughs> systems that we had just a few years ago. Remember, we had like four or five <laughs> in uh, a couple years back. Um, they were all this time of year, that time of year. That's a great question. What was the most hurricane names? <coughs> Excuse me. Dialogy season. <laughs> um, in one season, it was... Um, 2020. 2020. So what happens? I mean, we run out of names in the alphabet. We, well, I think what's our what's our plan B? I think that particular year we went to the Greek alphabet, and <laughs> they decided that you can't retire alphabetical numbers or, or Greek alphabet numbers. So they they have a separate list now of alternative lists that go from A all the way down to W that we that will add to the list, and we'll use that list every single year. One graphic that I, that I love that I want to show, and I'll let you cue it up, it's, it's the return rate. And you hear a lot of the, uh, the old-timers um, talk about the old-timers. I'm an old-timer. 
Um, it's been a, you know, lo we're long overdue. The last, and here's, the, here's a kind of a trivia question, when was the last hurricane to hit our area? Was not Sandy, was not Irene. The last landfalling hurricane is Hurricane Bob, 1991. It's over 30 years ago. It's been a long time. So then now you go, what is the last major Cat 3 hurricane? It's not Bob, it's not Glory, it's not Sandy, it's Hurricane Carol. Yeah, so it's been a long, long, long time. So this is just mm -hmm. the hurricane return period uh, for, um, just for storms. <laughs> Of, uh, I, I can't quite read it out. No, that, now that, is, for some reason, it, um, you know, on the Cape, it's, it's like 15 years. But here in southern New England, it, it's close to 20 years. So what this graphic is trying to say is that roughly every 20 years, within a 50-mile radius, we're going to get a, a landfalling hurricane. And longer period of time, you know, the, some of those stronger hurricanes, for instance, a, a Cat 3, the, the period of time is longer. 34 we years. We don't see them uh, as often, but... Uh, you know, everybody says it. Uh, I mean, you hear it a lot. I probably, I hear it a lot. We're overdue. Long overdue. And unfortunately, it's not a matter of, of if and when, whether it's this summer or, or five summers from now. But the fact that this season is supposed to be so ramped up, it just increases the odds of, you know, landfall. Now, whether or not most of these landfalls are in, in the Gulf, in the Caribbean, Florida or here in New England uh, remains to be seen. Where a hurricane goes is based on what the jet stream looks like that week. At that time. At that time. I mean, you can <laughs> sort of kind of get an idea where they might go, but one little change in the jet stream and then you've got you know, maybe a hurricane coming up the coast. All right, we're going to wrap up and we're going to close things out. I do want to say that, again, that the, uh, the official outlook from NOAA is coming out. Next week, I'll, I'll have a story. We're going to elaborate even more on what we talked about today. We're going to talk more about the NOAA Outlook and their numbers, which they're hinting uh, to be uh, an above-average season. So tune in for that next week. And, of course, tell your friends about this. This is on uh, WPRI.com. We do this once a month. And uh, getting a lot of buzz on uh, what the potential hurricane season uh, may be like. officially starts June 1st. All right, we thank you for tuning in to the, uh, this uh, segment of uh, Beyond the Forecast. And as always, we'll be here next month with another topic. We'll see you then.